holiday. Um, we have um, our first item. Um, Bob has sketched out. Is Bob here? Yeah. Bob has sketched out a, a resolution for us on the gym. Um, on the agenda, it says advocating for a full size gym for PS 150. Um, if you look at Bob's uh, I'm here. resolution, I'm here. Bob's here. If you look yeah. at the resolution that Bob very kindly sketched out, it it frames it as a gym for, you know, obviously coming from Bob, it's going to be about after school and about the community um, as well as 150. So we're probably going to want to change the language, Jen, just so we have it historically correct that, um, you know, advocating for a full size gym for CB1. Um, and then we can talk about you know, if we are lucky enough to get it um, about, you know, who uses it when. But I think that using the situation at PS 150 as a whereas is really smart, um, which this has here. And um, if everybody just takes a couple minutes just to read through it, we can then talk over it. Was I wrote it about um, it a month ago, so I don't remember it, and I don't have a copy of it at this computer on this computer. But Jen, I think just put it in an email to everybody. Yeah, I'm just whatever. It, it it was written quickly, so if people have suggestions, I'm happy to. That is fine, Bob. We're happy that you took the initiative. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And also, I would just say that there is this. Um, you know, I did mention the World Trade Center, five World Trade. Yeah. Um, there is this public comment period too, so maybe, you know, I don't know if Andrew's on the call. Uh, Andrew no. was here and I don't see him now. Yeah. Is that Rose is here who knows something about World Trade 5? Do you have any news for us? Oh, there's Andrew who's back. Is it? I'm on. I, I'm here too. We're just talking about um, World Trade 5 and, uh, advocating for a gym to be built there. And I know that we've discussed that with both of you guys and I, um, Bob has sketched out a resolution for us. Excuse um, me, I don't see the resolution. Could someone shoot it to me real quick? It just arrived in my box. No, wait a minute, it hasn't. Jen, did you get to send that yet? I did, but I'll also be sharing my uh, screen. With uh, a okay, great. Of oh, yeah, it just hit my box. Sarah, I just got it. Uh, okay. I just got the email. All right, good. If everybody just takes a second to look at it, um, we'll obviously be building on it. So it's uh, if you have points to add or things to say, we'll have time to do that. But I think it's a great idea, especially given our situation down here now where PS 150 has been denied. They have not been denied a gym. The gym has not been eliminated. Um, what they have is an elementary size gym. It is not a competition gym. So they can't they can't host any basketball or volleyball games there. They have a stage um, in the back of the, the it's a gymatorium. Right. So after saying they wouldn't build one, they did. Right. And so they have, they do have a gym space, quote unquote, that they can, you know, for the kids to have gym class. But we are left with another school, yet another school that hasn't been built with a regulation gym. And um, we have nine schools now, three of which have full size gyms. The Harbor School has just been denied a full size gym. That's on the agenda for next month, but it's amazing. I've been working with them trying to figure out what we can do because it's not going to fit at building 515. So, you know, and I most concerning and what I'd like to add as a whereas um, I'd like to develop this together ba together based on um, a call that I had with the Harbor School with the SCA that was really troubling. And I think I might have mentioned this a little bit last month where the SCA said the reality is that building schools in office buildings like we're forced to do now because they're 
isn't real estate to build schools from the ground up. The reality is we we might not be able to do full size gyms. We might, you know, but what we can do instead are these really beautiful dance spaces, alternative spaces, exercise rooms, yoga studios. All those are are great, you know, and I do think it's um, important to use the space that we have in the best ways possible to make sure you have some sort of recreation space on the location. But <clears throat> my argument to her. To Andrea Bender was, you know, I'm concerned that the SCA is now thinking that it's okay to make alternative spaces in place of building gyms at all. Because that, you know, you're talking about sports programs, and sports programs are responsible for, you know, turning people's lives around. They are self esteem builders, they're good for physical and mental health. Um, you know, they help kids get up and out out of poverty. Um, it helps students when it comes time to go to college. Um, there are so many, and it, it mimics the kind of work they'll be doing in a workplace, collaborative, you know, um, work that they'll be doing in their in their careers. There are so many reasons to support sports. I know I don't have to say that to this crowd, but. It was surprising that I had to say that to them, and I'm very concerned that we're in a trajectory where the SCA is not feeling the obligation to build full size gyms. And I think we're at a really critical juncture and I think, you know, 5 world trade is 1 location that we can pitch, but I would like the. Um, resolution to contain. Um, you know, recapping what we heard the SCA say. Um, what we feel about sports, some of the um, points we can make that I just talked about and have that be in here as well. So that this, if something happens at five world trade, that the points of the resolution can carry forward into, you know, the next available space. Um, but I do think five world trade is a great idea that you guys brought to the committee, which is, you know, we need to look into and they're just beginning to do that exploration. So I'm fine to tie this resolution to that as a potential space for this gym. Um, but I do think we need to move on this now. It's only going to get worse, apparently, um, this problem with gyms. Hey, Tricia, this is Wendy. Um, can you just, um, is there any way we could give um, approximate square footage of, of, you know, obviously, you know, competitive regulation, but remember how um, I think it was Peck Slip or one of them that mm -hmm. got a, a regulation. Maybe it was um, Spruce, but it literally is just the size of a basketball court, and there's no room for spectators barely. Right. So I think that we have to actually say, you know, sadly square footage, and and then when you're also describing the gyms, I think it's good to say out of the nine schools. So many have these small gyms that are, you know, and, and then describe them, you know, they're, I mean, they're really tiny. Um, give more detail because I think if people read this resolution that they need a better picture to your point about how dire it is. Yeah, I agree with that, Wendy, because, you know, this is the, the trap we got into at, at PS 150 and that we've been in before is they'll say full size gym. Well, it turns out they can call a lot of things full size. You know, we only have full size gyms at our K to eight schools, and they only feel obligated to build them um, for a middle or high school. But they're still not building them for all the middle and high schools. That's the problem. Even the so full they size should... gym. Which one was that? Was that that was? Uh, uh, I think just it was... eight nine has a, a full size gym. But to your point, they don't have tech that does. They I think have it they have the retractable bleachers. Um, but into into the basketball court. What's that? Yeah, I mean, if you pulled it all the way out, it goes into the basketball court. Correct. You can only pull it halfway out. Yeah. I well, think, I, I, I think right. one way to. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. I'm sorry. <laughs> go ahead, Andrew. No, there was a delay. My apologies. Go ahead, Wendy. No, no. I'm really, I'm done. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I would. 
possibly suggest instead of using the terminology full size, I'd use regulation size because regulation size has a definition to it for both junior high school, for middle school and high school mm -hmm. in terms of dimensions. And I think, you know, regulation size courts, uh, and, and you can put the dimensions with, you know, suitable infrastructure for spectators. That's a good point. And I think that regulation size, according to, you know, the, the one we're advocating here should be for high school. Because you can always play middle school on a high school court. You can play middle school sports, which you can't do. You can't do the other way around. Yeah, so the, the, at the typical high school court, just I'm throwing mm -hmm. out some statistics. Um, is 84 feet by 50, 84 long by 50 feet wide. Mm -hmm. That's a regular typical regulation size high school court, and your average middle school is a little smaller than that. It's about 75 feet by 40 feet. I'd have to look those up. I think you're right. That's what I have here. Andrew, you might know the answer to this. Can they? Um, when it comes to basketball, I think it's possible to do a square inside inside of a square um, to be able to have it work for both high school and middle school. Am I assuming something that's not true? So I'm not sure what you mean square inside a square. What you'll see some places, depending on the size, is they'll have almost like a, a cross, meaning they'll have the full size court going one way and then they'll have um, baskets that sort of lower from the ceiling going the other way, which would make for a shorter court. If you can sort of picture a cross one. Yeah. That's how a lot of schools accommodate, not in the city. I, I can't speak to the city, but that, that's how a lot of schools will accommodate two different size courts. That's sort of what I meant. So that's that's good to know. Um, so I think we should be advocating for a high school gym. They can make accommodations for it to work for middle school. And um, with space for for bleachers, you know, so that they can have. We have nothing with full bleachers. I don't think Spruce Street has bleachers that are open all the time with a regulation gym. If I'm not mistaken. Is anybody here from Spruce? Trisha, I, yeah. look in the chat. I I work at Spruce Street. I'm a teacher there and the bleachers are retracted. They can open up all the way, but it comes like right to the edge of the court. Okay. So so it's great that we have one, but you see the situation we have. We've got LMC, we've got Millennium, we've Trisha. got I'm going to interrupt just for a quick sec. We do need to recognize and put on here Trinity Commons, although it's not the public education system. It is a uh, basketball, literal basketball, full gym size basketball court that is associated with Trinity Commons. So we can't ignore it. We have to notate it, but it is again not promised for DOE. It is a competitive uses open to it's all. I agree. It, it is, and yet it's not. There's programming associated mm -hmm. with that space, and there are going to be people that are they're going to be providers that uh, commit and pay to to be there um, at certain times. And so we need. I think we need to just put it in the whereas as we recognize that it's there, but that it is a space that is not. As you say, it's it's a pay to play space, so therefore it cannot be guaranteed on a consistent basis. And plus, I mean, we want to build them with the schools. Do you think that the DOE has has Trinity Commons on its radar? I want to make sure that they don't use it as an excuse to ignore what we're saying. Yeah, but I mean, I've never seen them use a private space in terms of counting on facilities for themselves. But I mean, if you feel as though it belongs there, I, Sure, we can do it. Um, if, if I think it's important not to um, mix. I, I don't know. Am I, am, am I being heard? I don't know. I, yeah. Yes, um, I think 
it's important to not mix apples and oranges that what I mean, schools are schools, community gyms are community gyms, and what we're looking for at the five world trade is for a major facility, which was discussed uh, with us way back when. Um, the Trinity Commons space will not work for my opinion will not work and there might be some legal issues too will not work for PS 150 during the day the kids are not going to walk over there for gym it may work for after school but I'm not so sure it does that either because transporting kids is very difficult so I think as we just try to get our site I'm happy to discuss Trinity, I think we should discuss Trinity. I think we should discuss if uh, what happened at 150 and uh, what and what we can get as far as forward planning at World State or any other sites, the seaport or something like that. I would just add that, um, Trisha, that was fantastic that you had the discussion with the DOE and. I agree. It, you can't put a gym into an existing building. Uh, it just doesn't work because the, um, you know, you can't cantilever a, uh, you know, make the ceiling higher. But at 150 was a new building, just as PS 89 was in a building being built. And that is why we feel so, uh, I guess, violated, if I could. Take a word. That's why we feel so violated. They could have put a gym in there. They would have had to use more square footage. Am I right about that? I mean, they could have put a gym into 150. They chose not to. Well, I mean, no, because the, the the I will say after looking at the footplate of the school, um, I can't speak to whether they're full floors or how it was divided, but when you look at the footplate of the school and what they were able to negotiate to lease. Yeah. They maxed out the width. I mean, you yeah. just, Andrew just said it, you know, when you talk about a middle school gym, 40 feet, yeah. is just the playing space. They yeah, yeah. need 25. Yeah, but they could have, the, the, the building, the floors are wide enough for a gym. They would just have to put in two or three floors. It would be very, very expensive. But they could do it, but they chose not to because of the cost. Same thing at the downtown community center, which it's not. It's not wide enough, to, uh, Bob. How, you know, how many? It's, how, it's a thirty-four hundred square foot gym. It's it's a tiny gym. It's a little kids gym. No, no, no. How? But the question is, I mean, they that's match the width. Architects on the on the call. How big is the footprint of one fifty? How? They, they maxed out the width of that entire floor to build other than the mechanicals and the bathrooms, right, Rosa? So, so yeah, hi, this is Rosa. Hi, hi. here, everybody. Um, uh, so just the reason why one, uh, five world trade is such an opportunity is because there's nothing there yet. Everything yeah. is not even in design phase really is it just right. in like, it's in scoping, like, what are they going to build phase? Um, and the problem that we're going to have at five world trade is the same problem that you that they would have had at the ps150 building which is that they're not going to want to design they could have absolutely accommodated a full-size gym if that was what they wanted to do the problem is that they're not going to design where the core goes the core being the elevators and stairs um for like you know five floors of of school footprint um, when what they're really making their money on is the 40 stories of apartments that go directly above, right? They're, they're going to design around what works best for the apartments and then the school gets what the school gets because it's, you know, considered community facility space, which is less valuable. Um, and we're going to have the exact same issue happening at Five World Trade. And so, yes, it could have been accommodated if that was the priority, but it was never the priority. And so I think now is a really critical time with this specific resolution to step up and say for the community, this is absolutely a priority. 
we recognize that there is flexibility in how you lay out your residential floors. And if there are 60 or 80 floors above or whatever it ends up being, um, we want you to take into consideration that your core is going to have to be located in such a way to allow for accommodating a full size gym, period. And but then, you, guys, you recognize, Rosa, that the situation that we're talking about at Trinity is the same situation for Five World Trade. Five World Trade that's right. community space that's is, that's going right. to, it's going to be operated by the Educational Alliance, the same people who operate the Manny Cantor Center. It is not a public space. It is not run by the New York City DOE or any city agency. They have brought on board the Educational Alliance to do an evaluation of cross community needs. So that's why I mentioned not ignoring. They've already told us that's the plan. So we need to sort of reference if we're looking for more gyms in lower Manhattan. We need to include that, but also reference the connection that it needs to have. I agree with you, but I think there are some opportunities here. And the reason why I think there are opportunities is because they haven't even gotten the um, rezoning approved to allow for mixed use. And so everything is in flux. This is sort of like their, their goals. These are ideas, but th nothing is set in stone at this time. And I feel like now is a time when we can have a really strong stance and and um, they basically try to bully them into getting something that we feel is essential for the community, right? And I, I agree. My only point was to say that we need to denote it is immaterial for the operator. We are not saying that this is limited to the DOE. We need to include to ensure to push in that the operator, i.e., like a educational alliance, takes that into consideration for five world trade. Right? Agreed on that point. Um, one other thing I wanted to point out was that we had a meeting yesterday at land use um, regarding five world trade. And um, there was a lot of talk about what the facilities uh, would encompass in terms of scope and senior facilities um, and a whole uh, medical facilities and all of that. And of course, right now we're talking about, you know, a pretty insignificant amount of square footage. And so I think it would be helpful. I know that here in the resolution, you have 60,000 square feet, but keep in mind that community facility would incorporate the, the sort of community gymnasium aspect, as well as any medical facility aspect, as well as any senior center aspect. So, if you're asking for 60,000 square feet, but envisioning it as fully recreation space, then really you need to sort of like up that like significantly, if that's what you think is, is or be more specific that. Oh, hey, Rosa, yeah. I recall I, last night too, was the 60,000, wasn't that referencing their desire to have some sort of Equinox gym in there? No, so this is, I'm, ref, I'm referencing the 60,000 in the resolution that's on, on the share screen right now. Um, I think what we had last discussed um, at oh. Five World Trade was like something yes. ranging from like 20 to 25,000. And I believe that was what was listed as community facility. Um, zoning wise, it's separate. And then they had um, further space, which um, I can't remember specifically what the classification was, but that was for their, what, what would be, dis what was discussed as an equinox, but I don't know if that's what was intended. Right, and, and we, so and group definitely discussed a senior center they you know of course people were even mentioning you know ceramics and you know medical facilities and you know, senior things and but i think a gym goes hand in hand with a community center so there, there keep in mind there are two different facilities that were initially talked about at five world trade one was part of the community facility which they said they heard us loud and clear that we did not want any equinox we did not want a sole gym operator like a um, asphalt green, then it needed to be a community center that was representative of not only the youth, but also of the seniors in, in the neighborhood, because there are no senior centers, um, robust, you know, enough senior centers, I should say. Um, so in response to that, they came back and said educational alliance, but they are also building a physical fitness center for the residential community, right? So they're building it. So there's two different aspects of that. You know, an Equinox type thing would be for the 
separate and above and beyond the community facility that they said was educational alliance. And you're talking about five World Trade Center, Tammy? Yes, sir, I am. And just as uh, and who is t- who is talking about it? Uh, Empire State Development, LMDC, okay, EDC, and okay, Educational Alliance. They introduced Educational Alliance, and Educational Alliance came to a board m- meeting in the fall, saying that they were, you know, on board. They have been onboarded. So, they and, and this space, the amount of square footage that they're talking about, is how much? That's the the question. For, for educational alliance, fine organization. I think we're talking about that. I need five. No, I thought that was the ten thousand that we told them was like nowhere near big enough. Right. No, I think that we told them ten thousand wasn't big enough, and so then they came back like a little higher. Yeah, but so frankly, not significantly enough for what we want. So the concept of these other developers just to was not a uh was was more like a field house was more like large gyms it wasn't it was a community center and when asphalt green was built there was a movement to make that also by the soccer league a field house and so that is what this resolution is asking for it's asking for ross you know, athletic space, um, and which is what I'm telling you from is, cultural or senior activities. Right. It um, it is if we say that we only want all of that community space for a gym that is opposite to the position that the board has taken about supporting other you know missing needs in the community. We I, have. I don't know if that's what what the board when the board took that position, it should, in my opinion, it should reverse the position and it should ask for 50,000 square feet or somewhere of a field house where, where, where people on the weekends and weekdays and can play. That's what, that's what I'm asking. I don't know what the board's position. Can you send me what the board's position was? It may have been lumped into a I'm sure, I'm sure can find it. it was about the uses at World Trade Center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand there might have been something lumped in at, at five World Trade. This resolution sort of materialized as a discussion for large spaces for for the leagues and for uh, you know to to recreate, and that was what we I. And I admit this is a long shot, but that is different than, and I don't think, the, and, and, and I would say what the board's position is, and I would also say what the, what the community's position is, you know, many people need, want places for their kids to play on weekends and, and evenings, and we're just packed with the Battery Park City fields. So that is what, what, you know. That's what we're trying to get accomplished here. I mean, um, tell me, Tammy, get... is there any sort of a do they are they obligated to provide anything to the community? Yeah, they are. And how That's... much of this sixty thousand are they obligated? See, see that <laughs> that that is something that's in flux that goes into the GPP that we talked about last night is getting more space for community related needs versus the ten that they initially proposed. So it's so 10,000. Initially, that's what they proposed. And then Rose is right. They came back with more. We, of course, you know, there'll never be enough, but I don't want to also limit this. We want more gyms. We, we want to reference five world trade, but I also think we should reference the seaport area. If they're going right. to, one of the really major things is LMCR is coming out in EDC with a plan for resiliency. And we have stood firmly saying that. You know, we don't want giant developments, but it, even if they're doing a one story building, why can't they put a field on top of the one story building? Why can't they put a soccer field, a baseball field, a basketball court? We need them to think creatively when we right. when they're looking at resiliency from the Brooklyn Bridge all the way down to the Coast Guard building. And if they're building out or up, 
include open active recreation. Right. And this is, not, you know, that's why I, I, I hope that in this committee, you can look expansively throughout all of CB1 to look at enhancements. Right. So, so you're saying, Tammy, to not, not limit it to five world trade, but to say, you know, Brooklyn Bridge Park, if that ever gets built, the, you know, any of these other projects, the seaport, just, just give examples of what's on the horizon. Correct. And say we want it all. Why not? Right. Absolutely. Right. This, this resolution is really for the DOE and the SCA, you know? And so they have to then go and do these deals. What I, the yeah. reason I was curious how much they had to give is that, you know, we're not, as, as a youth ed committee, we're not doing that deal, right? We're not doing the deal at, at five World Trade. Other committees right. will be working on and, and weighing in on that. But we have to weigh in on, for youth and ed, given the fact that they are obligated to provide space, we would like to advocate for at the very least a 10,000 square foot gym. And then, you know, if where, we have- Trisha, where? Huh? A, where 10,000 square well, feet? Well, I mean, and then we go about the business of saying that Five World Trade is obligated to provide space to the community. We'd like to advocate for that space. We would like to advocate for um, the developers working on the resiliency plans over in South Street Seaport in the right. base of the island to be thinking about including um, gym space and recreation space as they go about designing this. We really need to just light a fire under the SCA. Um, and a really important part of this resolution is going to be how they fund this because as you know, or may, some of you may not know, they have never funded a freestanding gym. The first time they ever considered doing it was with Millennium, and we had to go and raise that money, as you'll recall. And the mayor's office and, and the SCA matched what we raised, and then all the money disappeared. So normally, the SCA only builds when they're tying the building to seats. This happened at Millennium, right? They got the 14th floor. We helped them. We advocated for that um, deal to go through, and they took it. We thought that whole floor was going to be recreation space because that's what they wanted. They have no gym. And lo and behold, they ended up building 18 classrooms. And they didn't get what they wanted in terms of open gym space. They had to take it. They had to fight to not increase enrollment. And now they'll have to go about the business of trying to demo it. <laughs> you know, this happens all the so, time. And so we have to make sure to change that when we go to do this. The last so thing that want is school seats and, and we're yeah, trying yeah. to get gym space. I'd also like to say that I think, Tricia, we can include Governor's Island on this resolution because even if it's not within the, one of the historic buildings, it should go in one of the new buildings. Or quite frankly, they have enough land out there and parking lot stuff. Why can't they resurface and, and do what we had years ago and bubble it? Just to, I mean, it's most important to have the services available for the communities. It's amazing to me that they gave the Harbor School Site 515. For those of you who don't know it, it's an old historic building, right? It's a beautiful building. We thought the pool was going in the basement and that the gym was going to be created by demoing some of the inside of the building. They want to keep the whole building intact, add way too many classrooms, way more than Harbor School wants, or can facilitate. that If they added the, as many classrooms as they have, the kids would be having lunch at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. They cannot have the core spaces service that many kids that they just put the classrooms in for in this plan. The architect has not started building, but it's it's happening all over again, right? Too many seats, not enough of the, the, the spaces that we went after, which is a pool and the gym. Turns out they have a courtyard that is only 40 feet wide, and their their idea was to put the, the pool on the bottom and build the gym on top of the pool in a space that is 40 feet wide. Now, try to wrap your brain around that. Nothing is regulation. It's a total nightmare to build. It's going to, I mean, it would be cheaper to build those two rooms, as an architect actually recently told us, outside on the lawn. 
They have a huge expanse of lawn. Even if they did the dive pool in the courtyard, one could argue they could get that away with that there. But, you know, Margaret Chin advocated for a, a competition pool so that the whole community could use it. That was the whole point. They even talked about the hotel guests being able to use the pool. And now yeah. they fully backed off of that. And now they're focused on this tiny little courtyard space. So this, so this is why this is why I say we 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 should include everything, exactly. every square inch that we have in CB1 and say including not limited to because But it's it, the trust, Tammy. I mean, you know that. It's not yeah. it's not does the city doesn't own it. I mean, it's the trust runs that space and every single exchange, I mean, to give the Harbor School 515 and not give them the yard in front of it, they Point gave them the building. All the trust needs is a donor. Let's be honest. If a donor well, came, if a donor came and said, I'm going to give this money, this is what I want. There'll be no arguments. But it, short of that, it's just sort of ridiculous that we are in this position for the kids. It is it ridiculous. Is I mean, well, you can't while I love them in a building and not give them the yard surrounding the building, that's a bad deal. You know, if they did that deal, it's a bad deal. So right now I'm still in the thick of it, but I am going to put a resolution together and we can use, we can cite that I have enough information now that it can be aware as I can cite the issue there and talk about the importance of building full size gyms and, and do it. You suggested Tammy and talk about. Five World Trade, the resiliency building that's coming up, Governor's Island, um, and and really Bank. also have a, what's you've that? Got so include, you've got to include Brooklyn Bridge Banks in there. Quite frankly, I know Rosa will kill me for saying maybe not. No, no I support that one hundred percent. It has to be included in there because you've got tons of schools who could use that space. Right, yeah, you've got schools across the street, one block away, two blocks away. Sorry. I mean, and and I think that the the you know what I keep pushing about that is that in that neighborhood we ha we're at twenty percent of the city median for active recreation space. Twenty percent. What and, other neighborhoods have? We only have one fifth of right. in that neighborhood, which and is that embarrassing. To the resolution as well, because we want to hit all. We want to hit the city on all aspects, and then be able to. Say, you know, we've spoken about this and quite frankly, have Chris Marte and Mark Levine turn around and support any or all. I mean, it'd be ideal if they supported all. We just. Yeah, Rosa, was that? I have to minutes? apologize. What? Sorry, My I couldn't. Raising thing is not working. What was that from? Oh, sorry, D double talk. I couldn't hear either of you. Your 20% stat, where's uh -huh. that from? That is, if you look at the, at the way they calculate open space, it's one, um, the amount of acres of open, open space per 1,000 residents, I believe. Uh -huh. And uh, I'd have to look back into my files to be absolutely, you know, specific and <laughs> accurate about that. But, um, you know, what's crazy is that that's obviously not taking into consideration the projects down the pipeline or the loss of the, um, the east side coastal resiliency area and the closure of that, which is going to be gone for at least five years and all of those other things. So it's actually less, it's significantly less because the population's growing. The uh, open active recreation space is lessening. So we're at 63% open space and we're at 20% um, active recreation space. That's where we suffer and the most. Um, and what's when really insulting- we, what, What's we, is it neighborhood? It's the neighborhood, yeah. It's and, and being FIDI? Um, it part of FIDI, but it's really it's probably more along the lines of Sestry Seaport slash Smith Houses. Okay. Yeah. What you say? I, I, I just have to jump in here because my hand doesn't work um to raise and one of these days I'll find it on this computer. I'm on a <laughs> um guys, I think that I would I would just throw this resolution pass it as a shot across the bow. I think there needs to be some long term planning on the community board between community groups and uh, community board. And, and I would even think that it doesn't have to meet all the time, but I think a subcommittee, because we're really talking about long range planning here. Our kids, you know, 
we're talking about long range community based planning here and we need a discussion uh, with with whoever the borough president, the new city council member, EDC, uh, the schools. We we need to position at some point, and you could use this resolution, or you could pass another one next meeting or two meetings later. That I would just start a, a task force and saying, listen, this is what we need. Twenty years ago, we decided, or maybe 30 years ago, decided that we needed fields at Battery Park City. And that worked. And everybody was amazed as to how much it became a sense of community. But I think in 20 years, there are many other communities, to Rose's point, that have a lot more than us. And if they're going to keep expanding Lower Manhattan, they're going to need to start thinking about the children that are going to grow up here. And I think that that should just be a sort of direction of the community board for the next year or two, and maybe a committee, maybe a general resolution. But I think Tricia hit the nail on the head by saying we need it more. And now we all need to just start advocating for better, more space. That's just my opinion. I won't be around when it's built. But I think we need a field house of some kind uh, because the little leagues and the soccer leagues and, you know, all these programs are full. Yes, they are. Yeah, they I, I would actually tie it to population because that's a really trackable number, right? So if, if you're talking about this is a number of children, then this is the sort of square footage of facility space that recreation facility space that you would want to provide for this number of children regardless of whether they are in public school or private school it's a civic urban resource and as far as i'm concerned it's infrastructure and so you don't add five million toilets and think that it's going to flow in the same sewage line right <laughs> you're going to have a right. problem that's you right have to increase the sewage line well you don't have five thousand kids and not have a place for them to go to school, you also don't have 5,000 kids and not have a place for them to recreate. So I think that it's absolutely essential infrastructure. Um, I think that we uh, basically say, look, this is an equity issue because it 100% is. And I think that we need to push for the city to have a policy of providing the civic infrastructure that goes with the actual population growth. And downtown, our population has been exploding. Um, and I'm sorry, pandemic be damned, but like they say, oh, the numbers have gone down. They'll go down for like three years and then they're gonna go right back up again. And so anybody who's counting on the numbers from COVID is like fooling themselves. We need to count on the numbers pre-COVID and the growth pre-COVID and supply for that. And we're, we're because it takes years to do these projects, as I'm painfully aware of, and we need to supply the infrastructure. And the pipeline to be able to satisfy and keep up with the demand as it actually happens. Right? Instead of always playing catch up, like, which is insane. Well, can it just I, all comes, I mean, Rosa, this is, it's tell? not a thing that they haven't heard before. Okay. They've heard this. We talked about this in 2003. And it always just comes back to space and money, you know, when it comes to there, you know, Andrea Bender actually said to me, if you don't like it, we can just remove it. Other people want the space. That is their attitude, right? They feel absolutely no obligation whatsoever to provide these things they see as amenities. When I quoted that in Levittown with their, you know, um, you know, I, I found out the amount of homes that they built in Levittown. I found out the amount of, of middle school and high schools they planned with that plan development. And I use that as, as an example. And she's her only comment was, or the, or the SCA at the time just said, well, move to Levittown. You know, there's absolutely no, they see it as apples and oranges. They feel no obligation to do the kind of urban planning that you're talking about with recreation space per thousand people. They think that living in an urban center, um, that all that is out the window. And so we've been more successful in um, talking about statistics for overcrowding that lend themselves to more of a safety concern. 
we've gotten everything we have gotten down here by selling it on a situation where they were concerned about something getting out to the press in terms of how many kids were in one room, what the elevator is like at 8.30 in the morning, you know, things like this. That's where their discomfort, you know, that's where they waver and not before then. And the other thing that we come up against all the time is we advocate for things that they don't have in any of the other five boroughs. And so they see us as a community that wants more of what other people than what other people have. And so we've always had to be very careful what we advocate for is something that's sustainable to do across the city. This idea that we have with gyms is sustainable across the city. And I think that that's, that's why it's something I think could really work, you know, as opposed to that outdoor space that and recreation space which they've never responded to and feel no obligation for it's why the hudson river park trust ended up being born trisha it's can i make a suggestion for an additional whereas uh -huh. um, when we're talking about urgency for timing um i want to tag on to what andrew and bob um were saying that from today for the next five years we will have inaccessible and use the acreage of not only east side river park that's now out of commission the total acreage of that park um, which we can get off of city data jen and lucian can add that in but i'd also like to add wagner because it's going to go under construction this year and that'll be totally out for two years as well as large sections of um, the battery so in terms of open active recreation space we at outdoor space we are losing the largest significant chunk in a post covid world when you would ideally like to have the most amount of outdoor space right space so i think that that should be a whereas in there in terms of sensing urgency well, we have to decide whether we're going to make this resolution about recreation space or about gyms. I think that that's going to be really important because. Isn't it both? Isn't a gym a recreation both. space? Well, I mean, it's programming. You know, I'm very sensitive to um, sports programming for our schools being something that's SCA. Recreation space is not, you know, and so. I would be more inclined to do two resolutions here because each of these things deserves its own resolution in my mind. Um, but, but the SCA yeah. is the target of this resolution, at least it was in my mind when I saw it. Um, could, could I ask the, that we add a whereas that says um, that pushes the SCA to actually work with other city agencies to locate um, spaces that the public schools could utilize, whether it's a usage agreement, like at certain hours of the day, certain days of the week kind of thing, or that if they are not able to locate these essential facilities within the buildings proper, then that they must contract out that use in other facilities that are within a certain distance or something like that. Well, I mean, we are saying that in terms of giving them these examples of five world trade, um, the resiliency, you know, we're asking them to, um, we're asking them to go out and do private public partnerships, which they've been doing forever. Um, and so that is not foreign to them. What, what we need to do with the SCA is focus. You know, they're really not the ones that are going to be doing recreation deals and open space deals. They're right. be doing the deals with the gyms because that's infrastructure that they're not providing on the school level. And we're gonna have a huge challenge with them anyway, in terms of how they fund it, because they have no precedent for funding a gym outside of school seats. So I think that's why I'm thinking it should be its own resolution because it's a big mountain to climb in this resolution just for the gym. And then I, I, as I'm listening to everybody, I just, I think, we really do need to pass one about open space going into this huge construction project. Um, we are kind of in a crisis if we lose the whole east side in Wagner Park. 
and the battery. You know, we're going to be very short on space. And I think that, you know, if we could pass a resolution that makes them conscious while they're actually going about this construction project in ways they can carve out this space as they go, you know, um, I think that could be a really important one to pass, you know, separately. That's why I was asking you, Tammy, about how much space at, at five world trade. Obviously, we could use 60,000, right? Um, and I think we should advocate for that. I think we can ask for it, but there are so many competitive uses beyond just youth, you know, because the seniors are looking for a place for a senior center. You've got other competitive uses around to ensure that, you know, opportunity. And the, the Educational Alliance is supposed to be doing a needs assessment. So, you know, we can. Well, who, who's ask, who are the people that they, when you say needs assessment, who's on that task force? Good question. You know, Don't because yet. if you recall, we had a task force that was a d way too late and over the holidays, it was such a waste of that horrible yeah. situation they we had at that horrible deal that was done with um, that media center on Broadway. But the one thing about that that I liked is that someone from the seniors world, the education world, you know, all in the performing arts world, there was a lot of representation at that table. And there, the Educational Alliance is the hired consultant to um, do outreach and determine needs. They haven't gotten up and running. The RFP has to be awarded to the developer yet, but they are the ones that LMDC has hired to do the assessment for whoever is. So what's their experience with our community? Their experience is not with our community. Their experience is the Manny Cantor Center and knowing how to run and operate and identify community needs and be responsive to it versus a soul. Um, the initial thought that they had had was that they were going to go with like an asphalt green, pure physical, you know, gym type of a facility for the community. But that doesn't. That doesn't actually meet the needs. Because when, and it certainly doesn't absolutely asphalt green has not met the socioeconomic diversity needs of the community itself. Um, based so on is its this practice. educational alliance reaching out to people like us. Eventually, when they are ready, yes. Oh, can, okay. we, can we can we encourage them to perhaps consider the model. That Hudson River Park used for pier 26 and Gansevoort, where they had. Public charrettes and, and brought. Different groups together to do just that, identify priority community needs for space. Absolutely. Thank you, Andrew. And actually, I think that would be a really great um a great comment to add to last night's land use meeting and a friendly amendment that you should bring up at the full board. Because I could, could, not, it could, I could not agree more with that. I think it's it, going to be critical to have that so that we get this right. Yep. It could yeah, go straight guys. in. So. Again, I just wanted to say that I agree. I just want to bring some closure. I would pass the resolution on five world trade. If you put a slash right next to it and said the South Street Seaport, that's too. But I think that we have identified a community need already. And that one of, because a community could have more than one need. And the need is for recreation space. That's what I'm trying. That's what I think many of us are trying to push. And I think though a second resolution um apropos to the DOE and and what we think they would do. My intention in drafting this was not written to the DOE but written to LMDC and I have a, a letter going out on five world trade. Um I think that we as a community board need to find a sort of committee and discuss our recreational needs long term. Um, and it's great that EDC is defining community needs, but I think it's important that the community board define community needs also on their own accord. And because we, we have that, we've done a lot of that, Bob. That's what we do in the in the budgeting process, and that's right. Been I understand, but so, so any 
so I, I, I talked a little too long. I would just pass two resolutions and let them land where they are. Well, I mean, we have to have someone that we have in mind, Bob. LMDC is really different than SCA. So we yeah, have that's to- what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying, D different resolutions. Yeah, are we going for the gyms here? Or are we going for open recreation space? That's a that's those are two very we're going different for, things. Let me just say what, what my intent was. My intent was to go for indoor recreation space that is large, that is a gym or a field that could be determined later, a field house. But I am trying to get built in lower Manhattan something of substance not me personally why, but. why are you limiting it to this to the tightest land spot in the middle of the island that you want to that they want to stick a thousand different things in why wouldn't we include south street seaport where we have and have stood for centuries on the, the so well, i agree so tammy i agree with that i'm just saying tonight for time's sake just to to get this out there and then to pass something and address this need of large open space, uh, large indoor spaces at all of our venues. But I do believe the best way to do it is in individual negotiations and individual resolutions, because otherwise it's too, it's not focused. And I think that Chris Marte and, and uh, Mark Levine have to advocate for this need for community board one. And that that's what I'm saying. And they'll, and then when they talk to city officials, maybe they'll get us something. That's, that's all I'm saying is to the seaport's another good chance. There aren't that many places. I would agree 100% with Bob yeah. that it needs to be true. The new better. market building. Yeah. We have a new market building. There's a yes. potential Coast Guard building. There, there are places. We just need to keep pushing. Yeah, yeah, I agree. In and I'm just saying as the process in separate resolutions. That's all I'm saying. Well, With we still haven't answered the question. You're talking about two resolutions that don't include the SCA, Bob. No, no, I would, I would address, I would draft a resolution that includes the uh, uh, that asks the SCA to do what they can. Well, what do you mean do what they can? Jim. Well, whatever we think they can. I don't know what the SCA can do. Uh, now I, they seem like they, I, I, I was going to say a disparaging word. Um, I <laughs> think they're done. I think the SCA is done in our community. There's no other projects in their portfolio for our community. And no, I don't absolutely think this, is. It's the infrastructure they failed to build. You know, no, we, have, we have, we have three schools where they basically just bellied up. No, on no, the no, but this, I'm sorry, Trish, but. There's nothing on the burner that unless you're asking them to take back the drawings and that hasn't been done since we turn changed the turning lanes on West Street that you're asking them to take back the, the drawings on existing on a, on an existing school. No, right? No, I am asking them to separate if they can't provide gyms in the footplates they're negotiating to build schools. They need to start building freestanding gyms yeah, I, in the I community that surrounds the school because we are going to lose our sports programming. We okay, have to so be able to have our kids play competitive sports. I agree with that. And now I understand what you're saying. So I would put that into a separate resolution. I think that's a, you know, to be it's it's a, it's a, it's going to be a hard one to for them to do it, you can't teach a uh, 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 an old dog, new tricks, but, but you, you can ask, you can ask. And I agree, but that should be a separate resolution. This is what I'm saying. So for right now, standing gyms, cause you fucked up, right? Yes. So, so right now th this is called more gyms for lower Manhattan, this resolution, I assumed it meant gyms, but you wrote it. So I'm going right. to defer to what you, I mean, we can do the gyms next month. If you want right. to advocate for recreation space, that is L, that is a different city agency and different right. money pot. And if you want yes. to do that, we can write that. Yes, thank you. And I said in the resolution, I think it was a resolution that gives, it says gym slash 
fields, I think. It's, it's, that's not going to work, Bob, because you've got two different money pots. And wait, wait, no, the, no, no. At fi I'm sorry. At Five World Trade, the whereas is the proposal to build a field house slash gym at Five World Trade. You could easily take at Five World Trade and put in the seaport. But what I'm suggesting is that it be a large facility with fields and gyms. The SCA is not going to do that. I didn't say it, the SCA. This is intended for other people. This is okay. So, Trish, so Trish, I think I think yeah. Bob is agreeing with what he thought was an SCA specific resolution to align uh -huh. gyms for schools, and then a completely separate resolution solely focused, at least initially, on Five World Trade and a multifunctional, right. multi-purpose recreation facility. Right. Is that yes. what you're thinking? And which one yes, is this yes. that I'm holding? Is this the SCA one? No, Five World Trade is the, the holding is not an SCA one. It's intended okay. for like when So we're not Russia... calling this more gyms for Lower Manhattan anymore. Well, you could call it more gyms recreation space for Lower Manhattan. Okay. Let's but, do but that. Not, I think... But not but not with a specific alignment to schools. Right. Yes. Okay. Right. All right. So this resolution is changing to be called recreation space for lower manhattan it is targeting first world trade as is in the first whereas it can have gyms be mentioned in the whereas is as uh the right, fact that right. we don't have many so that we can't use them on the weekends or for after school and other activities and use them that way, but that's the only reference specifically to gyms here. And then this will go to the mayor's office and the agencies that can come up with this yes. kind of funding, yes. right? And, okay. and just because of your initiative, I did have a where it because we because if the PS 150 school had a good gym, that would help the little leagues, it would help after school, it would help everybody, it would help all the community groups. But right. It, it's just they, the SCA won't care about that. So we, this right. is really for the mayor's office, city agency, yes. the about yes. recreation space. That's right. That's well, right. Yes, ESD. It has to go to that way. Sorry. It has to go to Empire State Development. Yeah. Okay. ESD okay. and LMDC. And All right. So I will. Um, I'll work up those points then and send it to you guys for approval. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Thank you. All right, and then next month we'll work on on the gym one because I think we really do need that one. Uh, yes. And I'll have the Harbor School by then, so I think it'll actually be a better thing. Um, okay, good. So, does anybody yes. have any other? We've raised a lot of points that will be considered and put in this. Is there anything else that someone's not heard that they think should be in the resolution? Uh, well, one thing I did want to point out is that the city does actually have a goal. So city planning does have a goal of what open space should be. And the goal is 2.5 acres per thousand residents. Um, so based, so the numbers I told you was city median. So that's like existing across the board. Okay. At, right. Um, but the city planning goal is higher than that. And so they do have a goal. They are trying, they are comparing, you know, in different neighborhoods to that goal. And just so you know, that area right around the Brooklyn Bridge Manhattan project is not at 63%. It's against city planning. It's at 38% open space and 12% of the city median, um, uh, sorry, of the city planning goal for active recreation space. And that's around the Brooklyn Bridge area, you said? Yes. Okay. Yes. I, I'm sorry, I don't have it community wide, but I, but I do know those numbers. All right, that's in 20%. But, but just so what? Sorry, go ahead. Let me just get this one stat from her 12% of the size of. Well, 12% of the, um, so it, they can, the city counts it as um, for city planning purposes, the goal is 2.5 acres per thousand residents. Right, I got that. And then 38%. We're at 38% of, of that. what that recommendation is around the Brooklyn Bridge, and we're yes. at 12% of what that recommendation is where? For specifically, uh, when you break it out, active recreation versus passive. So okay. active I recreation, which is what we're discussing right now, right. Um, is at 12%. Which and is, is that in our community yeah. district? 
That is, um, no, just in that specific neighborhood. Okay. Like, for so instance, like, like everything simple. along the whole, yeah, everything along the um, west side is like, <laughs> it's fabulous. That's where all the recreation space is, passive and active. Um, but like the east side has like, like nothing, like it, it literally has nothing. Um, right. It has parking lots instead of parks. So, yeah. Right. So just, just to po a point, um, if open use refers to outdoor space, I think we just to be we need to be careful that we don't confuse the message of this resolution, which is really focused on indoor space at five world trade. And maybe maybe we frame the limited outdoor space that's available to stress the need for indoor space, but I think it's important we don't confuse the two messages because I think they are different. They're 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 related, but I think they're different. Yeah. Okay. I agree, Andrew. I mean, again, it's like you're talking, you know, sports recreation over hanging out, you know, in in on the grassy knoll. In the park. Correct. Uh, those are two very different things. So I do read this resolution as mostly being about recreation space, you know, things that could be purposed for an activity. Am I reading that correctly, Bob? And not yeah, yeah. a grassy it's knoll. <laughs> and not a grassy knoll. Okay. All right. Perfect. I like grassy knolls. I mean, point? we could do the grassy knoll too next month. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, and God knows we're going to need it if they close all these parks for construction. Yes. Maybe. Yes. They're yeah. very useful. Um, okay. I think we've, I think I've got all the points. Um, if anybody thinks of anything else, feel free to email me, but I'll, I'll pull this together and, um, uh, add on to what Bob's got here with the points everybody's brought up today. So thank you all very much for your input on this. Um, we'll get it together. Um, all right, moving on. We are, oh, I still have this in front of me. Hold on, I'm going back to my agenda. Blah, blah. Um, sometimes I wish I had a really big screen. Bear with me. All right. COVID at home test kits. Good. So this is, um, you know, obviously with what's going on around us, there are, there's been lots of feedback about how we can keep our schools safe and open. Um, one of those ideas was to have kids test at home with these kits. Um, obviously, some concerns surrounding recommending that are, can we count on parents to give honest results, um, issues of equity around how much the kits cost, access of the kits, um, feasibility for that to continue if the pandemic continues in terms of supply and cost. So I just wanted to open that up for discussion. Um, I doubt we're gonna do a resolution on this tonight, but I thought we could at least start talking about it and just see where the conversation goes. Tammy brought this item to us. Hopefully, I, I'd love that she's here because maybe she can weigh in on some of the thoughts we <coughs> have. Um, so I can, I can give you, I've got two kids, at, three kids, two different schools handled everything very, very differently. So, um, and I'm sure Jeff can talk about millennium and other people can talk about spruce. Really, it was a point to have an ideal conversation for how whacked the whole thing is. And the, I mean, there's a lot of different issues. The high schooler now gets sent home if she's exposed the next day, two kids go home. That's it. That's their flat. I know at lab middle school, they just said, we're not going to do it um, based on exposure. We're going to hand out at home tests every week to all the kids twice a week. Because we just, you know, it's, it's just impossible trying to track who we did, who we did, and who we did, who we didn't. And the burden of this being put as an administrative thing back on the teachers and the staff is sort of on an insane side, right? That you've got to teach, you've got to worry about your own health, you've got to worry about your students' health, you've got to get everything else done. 
and your the administration is now responsible for handing out medical kits so there's that um there are lots of different take-home kits which are the things that measure your contagiousness and there is no tracking other than the honor system for reporting versus when you get your test and you log into whatever um uh the excelsior pass or whatever the case may be and then there's take home kits that you log in online what your results are so you can track and, and have some consistency across the board what i think my question is i know i see two totally different things at two schools and a third that i know of so how can we actually it's not even about today even if the pandemic disappears tomorrow Right, because the governor has said she feels we've peaked. What are we doing to look at the experience of what we've had thus far to make suggestions for improvement going forward? So that's where this all started going. And the frustration that I have as a parent having to be home with my child, which I love my children, but after five days, the CDC says I could go back to work. I don't necessarily need a COVID test, right? I could just go back no matter what. The DOE says you must be from day of first symptom, you must be home for 10 days and then you can come back to school on day 11. That's double what the CDC said. So there's a, a large kind of disconnect. How are you serving the needs of the parents and the caregivers and the needs of the teachers and the needs of the students. I don't have the answers. This is what this committee is so good at with such a diverse group of people. So I leave that out on the board and say, I know that you guys will figure something smart out. Well, I could, I agree with you, Tammy. The it's not even about the it's the communication. I have two kids, two different schools, but. Frankly, Millennium has been phenomenal with their communication. It's uh, factual and not the sky is falling. My son's school, it's, I stopped reading them because there's, there's no consistency. Just let's start with the communication. Let's just start first with the communication and everything else. Both sent tests and, you know, but uh, you're right. They need just to have a centralized uniform way to communicate. And I, I'm sorry if I missed some of it, but I asked uh, my son Dean what they're doing at his high school and every week they're sampling 20% of the kids and giving them PCR tests in the gym. And that's how they're handling it. Aha, but, but they had a screw up with the algorithm in the DOE because the way it used to be was they were testing 10% of the I believe unvaccinated students. So if you had 30 students who were unvaccinated out of a hundred in the class. Oh, I, I they were just doing 20% random. Which actually ends up being less kids tested. Yeah, it's just 20 the, of the school population every week at random. And he just happened to be part of the 20% the first week going back. At PS 150, it's what Tammy said, which is 20% of the unvaccinated population. Which I think literally ended up being like 3 kids differently because, you know, my son's fully back. So, I can address, I, I'd like to address possibly, possibly a, a time saver here. Um, first of all, happy new year, everybody. Um, and, um. Supposedly, a lot of people are saying that this is a spike for January into February. And I think before we get too caught up in all that we wish was happening, um, that maybe we wait. I'm, I'm fine with us fleshing out some thoughts here if we want to, if it's toward a, a, a purpose or goal. But I think until we see whether or not it actually does begin to die back down in February, as people are predicting, having watched it go through South Africa and other places, I think getting the DOE to shift policy under a new mayor who's gung ho about everything he does um, and is not going to close schools short of there being a giant catastrophe. Like, obviously, what he should be thinking about right now is, is the boldness of keeping schools open 
going to be a bigger mistake than closing the schools. And that's got to be what keeps him up at night if he's thinking about this. But given what we, given the unpopularity of the last mayor's choices around closing schools on this committee itself, the kind of pillaring that the schools took, I would just say, I don't think we should spend a lot of time, in my opinion, discussing what we would do because if if things are dying down at our next meeting in a month, we might have a lot of different ideas. But like right now, it's just total, it's every day is just testing, testing, kids coming in. I I literally took turned my camera off the store this meeting and took a test because I had an exposure yesterday. I had an exposure last Monday. Um, every day, more and more kids are being exposed. Luckily at our school, um, and thanks for what Sarah said. I think the money is doing a pretty good job with it or a very good job, honestly, but I don't know that we should, we're not going to get a lot of change out of this DOE right now with this transitionary moment we're in transitional moment. So I would just say that's where I'm at. I, I don't know the point of us going on and on about stuff with this because nothing is going to change because of a resolution we write in January in the first two weeks of this mayor's administration. That's my view. Thanks, Jeff. Anybody else? Anybody have any comments? Um, I sort of, I feel similarly to Jeff, I feel like it's always good to try to get out. And I, I especially sensitive Tammy to your thoughts about summer because we were so unprepared for the summer. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been interesting. Beacon um, has very few issues. Um, people get sick, but I think it's also because that triple vaxxed people are having such mild versions of it that at least maybe it's just there that I'm not seeing like anything that is shut down awful. It's awful when the teachers are out sick, you know, that's, that's never good for them or for the class. We have had a little bit of that, but again, they're back much faster. They don't get as sick. There's just like a different vibe around this round, at least in our household and everybody around us has it. I mean, like, it's, it's, it's almost like, I don't know anybody who's really ill because I'm around people who are triple vaxxed. So I know I'm very sensitive to the fact that there are people who are not vaccinated and that we should be, you know, making sure that we stay out in front of things to provide a safety net for those who are not. Um, but so far, this has worked much better, at least in our world, than it worked when everybody was home. <laughs> that, you know, still, for me, the job the schools and the city did then, I think, was much more challenging. I'd be interested to hear if anybody else is having that experience. We're having issues in this household with private school for my kid in private school that needs PCR tests to go back to school. Um, when they're on a seven day delay, she hasn't been able to go back to school since the holidays and the semester's ending on Friday. So that's bad. We're having much more difficulty with that than we are the one going to to beacon with the test kits every day. <laughs> um, that's actually been going quite well. So that again, I, I wanted to say that because I have this unique point of view, which is not ordinary. I'm aware. And I wanted to make sure and, and mention that when I give you my point of view on on whether we should tackle this any more deeply at this moment. But I'm I'm sensitive to other people who have different experiences, so please speak up if you do. Does everybody feel as though we should be weighing in to the point of a resolution on this? I will say that 276 changed their had the DOE change policy from the end of break and then we got an update January 1st and then we got another update January 4th. So there are policy changes being done on the fly. With testing, you mean, Tammy? With the return to schools, yep. So did they have mandatory testing before the kids could go to school at 276? Suggested, not mandatory, but right. the amount of time that you needed to be out versus in when you could return changed. When you could return after being sick? Whether it was from first day of symptoms or first day of positivity test and whether how the how it worked 
and then whether you had to test negative to return or just sit out for 10 days. So do you feel as though that's something that we could weigh in on and try to standardize? I think we could ask for it across the across the band. So high schools are one thing based on age vaccinations, middle <sighs> schools and lower schools. You know, they should have some consistency across the board somewhere. You know, the, somebody needs to be out. The real issue now is testing. I, I'm sorry, is consistency and a number of people just now have used that word. I could tell you from the many schools we are in, they are not consistent. Um, and the, the standards are not consistent, but I would also add. That the real issue these days is not the children who have COVID but the close contacts of children who do not have COVID and are missing school because they do not, they do not have COVID, but they have been next to someone and they, ha they are required, not all schools are enforcing this, but they are required to stay home for five days as a close contact. The tracing and certain are the core, they've, they've lost that battle, the tracing corp, they, you know, and it's been left to the principals, the poor people, and to us. We've had kids dismissed to us in after school that were positive, but the school didn't know about it. I mean, it's, it's really, uh, I don't want to use the word chaos because I think in the end, I'm very optimistic this is all going to work out if everybody's vaccinated. And I think the only thing we can do as a community board is to, advocate that school children should be vaccinated and that that school children should be vaccinated and boosted and that will bring us to the end of this not and that's just my own personal opinion but weighing in that way i don't know why we have not i mean it's politically not feasible i understand that but it's sensible that people should be vaccinated and it works you know, that's why people aren't getting so sick. Anyway, that's me. I'd like to weigh in. Please. I, I agree with Bob. I think that all the kids should be vaccinated. But from my, from my unique view is I have a two-year-old and it took almost two years for it to finally hit her daycare. And it just hit her daycare after she missed two weeks because of the holiday. That's my fault because we were gone. And she has to stay out without, oh, she has to stay out for 10 days. That's their, that's their recommendation. It, it, the problem I'm having is with a two-year-old. I've tested her nine times during this. She's so afraid to go back to a doctor just for a regular checkup because she thinks she's getting something shoved up her nose. I can't home test her because she thinks something's getting st uh, shoved up her nose. That's right. So it's. But I'm in that unique area of I still have to wait three years before she's even up for uh, vaccination. So I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. Luckily, I work from home, but I also had a seven hour deposition before this. <laughs> so it's not not the best. So I, with daycares, I don't know what to do other than just deal with it. But now that it's finally hit, all right, well, kids will go back next week. And a bunch of more kids will come back because there was another contact and then it's going to be out again. Right. Imagine I'll just keep her home for a month until this. And, and I agree with Jeff that this might not be that long of a spike. It might, February might be a little, a little different. Probably. The governor was on today talking about that, saying that she feels that uh, we have plateaued, which is a blessing. There is a movement afoot by credible people to say that unless your child is symptomatic, they can go to school. And, and that would be a lot easier. I, you know, it's more complicated for children under five, but, but to Eric's dilemma. Um, but, but it would be a lot. There's a movement to say children who are asymptomatic, they can go to school. If they're not showing symptoms and eventually. That's the way it's going to shake out, 
but I just throw that out there. I'm not advocating that position, but th th there are some credible people saying that. Not just lunatics, you know, that are, you know, you know, say open it up, but it's, it, they're, they're credible uh, physicians. Sorry, can I just ask a clarifying question going back to Tammy's initial comments? Sure. What, what, based on Tammy's initial comments, what would the, what would the request be of a potential resolution? Is it that the Board of Ed adopt a more consistent policy across all schools or I, I think I might have lost track of what the, the potential message or ask might be. That was going to be my ask is that there not and not just for this, but for a policy for this type of a situation looking ahead. Yep. Because think about how far we've come from where we were. We're in a position now that people don't know which way it is up. And I think that adds to some of our attendance issues because people don't understand and yep. it's changed so much that if we could we could ask for some consistency. And then it you know across all you know all high schools have this policy all middle schools or k to eights and and elementaries have this then i think it would certainly add add stability to the economy and the schools and the families so, and so i i support that ask i i both for covid and as tammy mentioned for other episodes that might be as disruptive as COVID. And, and it, if you think about it, it's somewhat analogous to the conversation we were having about the frustrations with remote learning that each school was using a different approach. And I mean, we were, we were pretty frustrated with that. And I, I thought we went down a path of advocating for more consistency or, or something that was just more manageable to families. We did go down that path. I'm just trying to understand how we do it in terms of how they handle quarantining when it's so site specific. You know, it's I've heard like people say, well, we can distance here in a way they can't at a school that's not as large. You know, um, I've heard comments that like reflect, you know, the student body and how many they have in the, you know, in terms of their bands during the day and how many kids they have in the building and how they can just make changes to how those bands go to free up space. Um, how some classes have worked well to meet twice a week instead of three times a week. They found sort of a sweet spot where they can not have to do that. Like I, I've just been trying to think about how we can ask for standardization with all the different buildings kits? we have. Hmm? How about on handing out testing kits? Well, so I mean, that's certainly straightforward. You know, testing kits on how many days a child needs to be home, whether a test is required to return, a clear rapid is required to return, yes or no. Okay. Because if the CDC guidelines say five days and you have a kid who's cleared off of a rapid test as negative, I guess my question would be is why is that if the CDC guidelines, why is that child still home for five more days if they've cleared? Right. right. So I, you know, this, I would have to have your help with this, Tammy, because I'm not aware of what these things are. We're not experiencing that where I am. And so I would love your help if you, if everybody does want to write this resolution. We can definitely do it. I just need the whereases, you know. And I think we can, can't we kind of narrow the scope? Because it seems like we're talking about school protocol in the event of exposure. And when you're talking about exposure, exposure is defined, I guess, as if you were in proximity of six feet for more than 15 minutes. So that, that should obviate the issue of what the school infrastructure is like, because if there's exposure, there's exposure. And then I guess we're talking about how long they have to quarantine, whether exposure or a positive test and what's required to return. I mean, if we narrow the scope to that, it seems possible to structure something that 
doesn't disrupt the notion of the environment and helping to protect against contracting COVID, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. I like so that. So really focus on the testing, the quarantining. Consistency around one, if a child is exposed and exposed uh -huh. has a definition from what I understand. Yeah. So if, if you've deemed that a child has had exposure, if you've deemed that a child has had exposure, what is the policy for a child attending a public school in New York City? Again, I, I maybe I'm struggling with this, but I don't. If we're talking about the fact that you've deemed exposures happened, the notion of less kids or twice a week versus three times a week, I, I'm not sure You're it's right. relevant at that particular no. point. It's not. That's a really good point, Andrew. You know, it's much you're taking something that's um, much more simple than how to deal with kids in the school. Um, yeah, I'm not talking about prevention. I'm talking about reacting right. to what happens if you've deemed a child's been exposed. What's the protocol? And it, I don't know why it can't be consistent. And two, if someone submits a positive test, What's the protocol that has to happen before they can return amount of days and do they need to present something in order to return? Well, I think in my, my question is. Are the days the determining factor or is a negative. A negative um, contagion. The determining factor, you know, a minimum of X days return with a negative rapid which tests for exposure, because if you've got a child who tests negative after five days, why is that child still home for an additional five? If well, that could yeah. be under, that could be under testing protocol. You know, I mean, if we have a, if we have testing, quarantine and exposure as our main points, then under testing, you could have that, you know, specific, you know, narrow down the specifics of what the criteria are, yep. you know, and say, you know, what is the determining factor? Because it wasn't long... CDC guidelines this time. This time around, it's far beyond CDC guidelines. It's New York City guidelines. I think uh, I would save us a lot of time and not go down this rabbit hole tonight. Well, I mean, if we are going to do it, we probably would want to do it now because we are going to peak. It's if people not, feel like things are unmanageable. There's so many inconsistencies with testing and and exposure that you know, we could do it. I mean, and also who's listening? Um, the uh, that never stopped us before. Um, you know, it's just you know the question of. The way the schools have been doing it, if someone's in the same class or in the same activity in after school and someone's got COVID, then the close contact sends everybody home. But you don't take into consideration the fact that, I, I mean, there's just, I can run a, 10 inconsistencies that in the lunchrooms of the schools, the kids are right on top of each other eating and they don't send the whole lunchroom home for close contact. They don't know who's next to each other in the lunchrooms for ex and then in addition the, the schools have said or the doe has said oh if you play basketball you have to be vaccinated but if you play something else or you're right on top of someone else you don't have to be vaccinated um and show your vaccine card to the uh after school program but you don't show it when they're playing basketball during the day school it's it is very inconsistent and, and Michelle could probably add. I was just going to call on Michelle. Hi, um, so I thought I could share a little perspective from a teacher who's had my class full quarantine 3 times and now we're doing something new. So, the guidance my principal has been sending out, I work at Spruce Street and it's also the guidance on the DOE website that has been really helpful for me as an educator. Is that if your child is exposed to COVID at school, they take a test on the 1st day. If that test is negative, they can come into the classroom the next day and they can continue to attend school. However, they have to take a test on the fifth day after exposure. 
If that's positive, then they have to isolate for 10 days. So that's the guidance from the DOE and I can also send that too and what my principal has been doing. And personally, that's been really helpful because when the full class closes down, it's really hard to get anything done. And that's been really helpful in my school as well to not have half of the population at home, half in school. Um, and that's regardless of vaccination status based on my knowledge. Um, I teach first grade, so I, you know, it's kind of iffy on who is, you know, fully vaccinated and fully not. Some are, you know, one dose, some are two. So that's the guidance my principal has been passing along and it's been really clear and it's been that's really good, helpful. Yeah. And she's also created a form where parents upload the results. And so the teachers don't have to deal with anything COVID related, which is different from December when we were all trying to go through emails and find out, you know, things like that. So that's what we're, that was the DOE guidance that we got. And I can ask Michelle to come back, right? Yes, yeah, so you, you're just you home have, for 10 days. So this is the guidance that my principal is sending out. I just sent the link, um, but they need to test on the fifth day. And if that result is negative, they continue to come and they don't need to test again. If it's positive, they do have to quarantine for those 10 days. And as teachers were required to provide asynchronous work for them while they're at home. But that's my question. That's yeah. my that's that's my linchpin because the CDC guidelines after an exposure are five days. Five days. Not yeah. 10. DOE's is 10. Mm -hmm. And there's no test requirement to come back in. But if the child is home, let's say it's CDC five days and you test and you are negative, why wouldn't we support having the child come back into the learning environment? Yeah, I, I totally this is, agree. This is CDC on its own and they're following CDC. I know this because we had friends that got stuck out of the country and the parents had to quarantine five days, but the kids had to quarantine 10 and they asked the same question. And they were told just because. <laughs> and that's where I'm getting at is the burden. I have friends, the same thing who came back and the parents were very stressed because they had to figure out how to get childcare coverage for five days, even though, because they went back to work, they tested negative after five days and then they had children who were still home. Right. So it well, was a, is this on the DOE website or is this something Spruce Street did on their own? No, it's, it's DOE. This it's is DOE. the DOE and I, I sent a link in the so chat. There is a protocol then. There's well, a but protocol is it, for... Is it guidance or is it, is it protocol to be followed by all schools? I, I understand know elementary schools, I don't, or K to eight. I don't know if it's high school. I, Jeff, do you remember? Michelle, I don't see it in the chat. Yeah, Michelle, can you try resending it to me privately and then I could or send, and, and also email it to Jennifer so she could distribute it via email later. Did that go? Yeah, what's like, the question? It sounds what's like the there question? is a protocol, right? There is a protocol the DOE is putting out. Yes, it's the protocol that we just heard. Okay. So where where does we're, quest we're questioning the 10-day incubation, incubation. Um, compared to CDC guidelines, yeah. So, well, the thing is, is that for teachers, our we're we're just like Michelle. We're both of our schools are following the same thing, and also welcome to the community board and committee, Michelle. It's good to have another teacher here. Okay. Um, so you know, two, second day exposure, fifth day, two day, five day. Administrators come into the classroom if they know someone is exposed. It's different than Michelle because I don't have all the same kids in the room all day. Um, and so every kid who's been with someone who's been exposed is tracked and they're all given kits. They're told what to do and they communicate. Teachers can return after five days, like Tam was saying for adults like her and others in, in the work world of CDC. Teachers quarantine for five. If they're, if they're non symptomatic, they can return after five. My point again that I said earlier was with us hoping the spike might come and go. I don't know that getting the DOE under a new administration on the 11th day of January to change their entire set of policies is worth the time we're already spending talking about it because I just think it's right. not going to happen and he's not going to back down. And that's that's my strong belief about the, the walking this man. 
The five day quarantine could be a game changer for people. Do you think we should be advocating simply for that? I think you know? I think in February, if if we're still going on like this, we should do exactly what you're saying and say, let's adults are five days, kids should be five days. Isn't right? that, These are no symptoms. I might have missed something uh, just because I had to step out, but essential workers, don't they have to only get five days? Everybody's five days except for kids. So why, why kids should be five days if they're if it's the same? If they do, they incubate differently. Why did the CDC come up with with ten days? I mean, is it a school thing? CDC did not. That's DOE. It is, but no. If the people the coming back from the C Mexico, CDC and then the CDC changed it, and the DOE didn't keep up with it for the kids. Ah. Uh, I think you could write an incredibly simple, basic resolution if you guys wanted to, just saying if it's ten for five for adults, it should be five for kids. Yeah. But I wouldn't get carried away with anything else. It would just be a little bit like, whereas adults are coming back after five days, whereas teachers come after five days. Yeah. And whereas many schools have so solid procedures with a two day to five day test, therefore be resolved, we propose students who are able to return to class after five days and then just be done with it. And I don't think it's going to happen because I think the mayor's going to hold to his guns for this for 20 more days or, you know, till the end, whatever. But you could do it real simple one like that. Jeff, I think that's, that's a all we're, cool that's all we're really looking for, isn't it? Just to, to yeah, to, let's do that to, then. To you know, if 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 they have a policy, and the, the one and five day testing seems like that's acceptable, and the ten day incubation is the killer, then let's just do that. Simple's great because it gets them to focus, you know, on that, and it, and that is crazy. Yeah. I mean, and it's expensive for parents if if they're keeping them home ten days. So why don't we do that resolution that just says, whereas, you know, adults are told to incubate five days. Um, and whereas teachers the DOE yeah. and the yeah. teachers and yeah. whereas the DOE has children incubating 10 days um, and then talk about the hardships for parents who work and child care and throw those whereas is in. Therefore, be it resolved, the DOE um, makes incubation the same for everyone, five days. I appreciate you taking this into consideration. I'm putting, I'm putting it in the chat in case you want what you just said. I would leave out the part about parents being inconvenienced. That's not really the argument. Not inconvenienced, not inconvenienced. Child care. I'm just saying, I would just make it, if it's five for kids, it's five for adults, that's it. I mean, I think when you start bringing in child care, you start playing the tune they want us just, to play. I need which some whereas. Which is that about... schools are, 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 are places to take care of your child rather than educate your child. They are both. But the primacy of the argument right now is all about we need a place for kids to be so adults can go back to work. Bear in mind that many adults have not gone back to work. I just rushed to get back to the meeting through Soho. You could have driven your car right into the Hudson at 6 o'clock on a weekday. There was zero cars waiting at the Hudson Tunnel. I go that route all the time. I can usually go between cars that are gridlocked. So people aren't even going into the office. So that whole argument's, you know, I don't know. I just don't think why play on that field? It's a simple Our office came back and they said, don't, they said, this is happening. Don't come in anymore. We were, we were once a week since August. Come in once a week, whatever, once a week. Yeah, but that still doesn't enable you. If you're working at home, you can't take care of your child and you can't educate them. Yeah. You know, it takes us back. If you take care of them, I can't educate them. I think if you wanted to add a, a reason, you could say to limit the academic, like, regression of students. If I have a yeah. student, yes. I can't yes. progress with units if half my class is yes. out. So I would just tie it back to, because that's the big challenge with educators right yeah. now is academic regression. And I think that would hit parents too. I think that's beautiful in your today. And I can't agree more. And Jeff, the funny thing is this mayor wants people back in the city. He recognizes that with the companies going, oh, oh, just stay home. We can't get the economic engine turned. So this actually may be something to be willing to listen to. It's super short. It's super sweet. I just put, whereas adults are five days, you can see what's in the chat if you want it. Um, 
if you, if you want it, Trisha. I really think what Michelle is saying is the route to go, which is it's about education disruption. I think focusing on that, that's just my view. It keeps it simpler. I don't see anything in the chat. It's, um, oh, it's I'm having, tr I'm having trouble with the chat. Oh, it says privately to the host. Sorry. I sent it to everyone. So everyone it says, it. whereas adults are five days, whereas CDC recommends five days for all people. Yeah, I, I didn't write nicely. I was just trying to get the ideas down. <laughs> but I thought Michelle's point about, I mean, that's what Michelle and I are experiencing. I have, I'm doing a Macbeth project and right now, I have groups of five working on Macbeth and like two kids out of five just are gone for the next 10 days. So they're gone until after we're supposed to perform because the semester ends on the 24th. So those are the things that are the power, more powerful argument to me is the disruption to learning for 10 instead of five days. Yeah, okay. Agreed. And the that. only reason why, Jeff, I want to push it this month is because yeah, there's, February break. there's February break coming up. I'd yeah. like yeah. to fix before then. Well, right. I mean, if we're, start we're, now, you might get it by February if they're still spiking in February. Right. Exactly. I mean, if we're going to do it, I think we should do it now. Thank you. I appreciate the consideration. My All husband's right. my husband's been here four times telling me I'm late for dinner. So right. I can go. I appreciate you all. Thank you so much for the work Thank tonight. You. All right, Tam, baby. And welcome. Be good, on. Tammy. Don't get in no trouble. Okay. Oh, he's going to kill me tonight. Good night. Thanks, Tam. I just want to weigh in. I haven't really spoken much, but I've been listening and I agree with this resolution wholeheartedly as a my kid is in first grade at PS 234 and it's been a big disruption there as well. So um, definitely like where this is heading right now. All right, great. So our only whereas is on this are going to be are really focusing on um, academic regression, loss of learning, um, the CDC recommendation that changed with the DOE did not change with it. And that's it. Does that sound good to everybody? That sounds great. Really simple. Right. It'll be probably like a half page, which will be It'll easy. Be a half page. It's got five lines total. So, right. All right. Good. So I realized we didn't vote on the previous one. So we're going to vote on both of these right now. And then I will craft them and put them in everybody's box this weekend. Uh, so the first one is about um, uh, the recreation space in lower Manhattan. Um, and the second one is for the incubation time for COVID uh, from 10 to five days. Jen, can you take a roll call for us? Yes, if a member of the floor could call the question and someone else second, please. Call the question. Sorry, can I just ask one question on the first resolution? Uh-huh. Are, are we specifically tying it to five world trade? Um, no, because it's recreation, right, Bob? Didn't you want to? Well, it depends how you you finally write it. I would tie it to Five World Trade and any other major development projects in Lower Manhattan. Okay. A and with a focus on indoor. Yeah, I mean that's what we're talking about now, indoor, right? Yeah, just if we don't stipulate indoor, it could be construed as more well, outdoor recreation a, space. If someone gives us a sixty thousand square foot field, I'll take that too. Of course, but and recreation is the word you want to use, right, Bob? Uh, I don't know. You know, I haven't thought. Yeah, recreation. Yes, recreation. We are referring to schools in the whereases, so there will be the context of. Yeah, that kind of recreation. Um, yeah, I just are, yeah. We're yeah. talking about developments, which is going to then lead people to indoors. So we've covered the context in those two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just need to get on record and follow this up with all the major parties. I think no, Andrew's got a good point though. We really want to separate this from sitting on the grassy knoll. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. For sure. Okay. So, Andrew, I'm going to make sure this keeps a very much an education after school sports vibe to it. Um, yep. And that all the references will be to developments, indoor space in developments good. that are being. Great. Sounds great. Okay. All right. Good. So, Jen, take us away. Okay. And someone's <coughs> second, right? Okay. So, Trisha, for, for both Brazil's, right? Yeah. For Trisha? Yes. 
Hey. Sarah's still with us. She's she's not. Okay. Uh, Jeff. Yes. Am I on? Yes, oh. I I heard you. Thank you. Helena. Yes. Okay. Wendy. Yes. Okay. Darren walked off. Eric. Yes. Okay. Kenny. Yes. Michelle. Yes. Bob. Two yeses. Andrew. Two yeses. And Sarah Aish locked off as well. Okay. Um. One, two, three. Okay. With all the votes counted in, the motion passes for both resolutions. All right. Wonderful. Um, and then quickly, uh, I just have a very small update on Edgar Street. Um, we had that quick meeting with the DOT. Um, the memory is very short. You know, it just reminds me we can't let much time go between these check in meetings. Um, and uh, fortunately, we did have someone there talking about the bus. We are advocating for a bus that opens on the left side um, because they are going, the bus stop is going to be at the corner of Trinity Place and Edgar Street um, in the eastbound lane that is staying open on Edgar Street. Those kids will then pop out of the bus and either walk out the right door and in front of the bus over to the plaza that's being created or they'll walk out onto the left side where they will plop right onto the plaza. That the latter is obviously ideal. There apparently are not very many of these left door buses. So we have to advocate for getting those for this school. And everyone's clear that that's what we want. We can make it work with the right door bus now that we got the closed street, um, because at least they're not crossing an active lane of traffic. They are crossing in front of the bus onto an inactive uh, street, which is good. Um, so I wanna make sure everybody understands that when they see these choices. So um, the two choices that we have that we can advocate for, and we have another meeting coming up. So this is nothing to do a resolution on tonight. When we have the next meeting, um, we'll be able to, Jen, do you, um, can you pop up the pictures that you sent in this mail so people can see a visual reference? Can you share that screen? You it's sent this to me at 3.59. Okay, let me see. And I'll read it now. The closure of the westbound Edgar Street. So the westbound, you guys, is the lane that we advocated to close because there is a seven foot sidewalk on the south side of this school. The traffic would be very close to these kids. And remember, we have an elementary school, which means there's a caretaker for each child and possibly, you know, siblings and strollers. So we were very glad that they agreed to give us to extend that sidewalk close that westbound lane of Edgar Street, if only during school hours, but just to make sure that when these kids come and go, that they have that plaza. So the choices are the closure of Edgar would only include only temporary materials such as granite blocks, planters, or delineators blocking each end to prevent vehicles from entering the roadway, similar to what is shown in the picture. Were you able to get it, Jen? Does everyone see my screen? Trisha, is that the photo that you were referring to? Let me get back there because I'm looking at your email. That's it. Can you blow it up a little? Let me see. One second. Let's see. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Okay, how about now? Good. So if you'll see guys, um, there are those little metal bing bong things that are there up against the crosswalk. Can you see them? Those prevent cars from driving across that section. So that would be one option where we do something temporary like that. The other option is, um, make sure I've got all this. Yeah. The other option is, oh, they wanna clarify with that option, that the sidewalk on Edgar Street will be about 12 feet wide when the project is completed. They're doing that automatically because of the mechanicals that the developer has to put under the building. So they automatically have to widen the sidewalk. Um, the DOT will not be able to extend the sidewalk so that it is flush across to the median. That's what we had hoped for, but that is going to be a capital project that will have to be in the future. So apparently paving over that whole thing, creating those little ramps up from the, the street up to what is gonna be seven inches higher is a capital project that takes you know, many years, different kinds of approvals, and they're not against doing it, but they feel as though we need to find a solution for the fall. So this solution will also give us the opportunity to try it out and get community feedback. Right now, we do have a lot of people very much against closing this westbound lane permanently because the decision about whether to make Greenwich Street two way again has not been made. And if it stays one way, this will create a bottleneck back up on Cedar. I'm sure you've heard Pat Moore talk about this, who lives on Cedar, which is not, you know, it's not nothing. Um, it also is one of the two entrances to the battery garage. So what we thought is this wasn't a horrible idea if we could secure the street and close it when these kids are arriving. Um, and possibly at other times. I mean, right now the spur is closed. It's not gonna be open till 1 p.m. each day to bring the empty buses up into the city. So every morning the battery tunnel spur is closed and no traffic is coming up Greenwich Street from the battery. So we really do have this quiet, you know, nobody on the street opportunity there. Um, so they wanted to clarify that. And then choice two is to have the school apply for open street and have removable barriers for the times that it's closed. So for option one, they said they'd be able to get it in by summer. And for option two, it would fall under an application for open street that the school would need to apply for by this spring to be able to make it in time. So we, I'm really pretty neutral here. These are both um, temporary, um, flexible solutions. And I wanted to bring it to you guys for some discussion um, to take back to the meeting that I'm gonna have with them soon. I hope that was clear. Wouldn't it be good just to do something that they can handle alone and they're not depending on other approvals just to so it's a guarantee that it's done and then the school could still apply for the open streets but that in case the application gets lost or delayed or whatever at least you have something i i would agree with that i mean it's i don't think they're mutually exclusive um yeah i think you should say yes to both i would yeah I, I would say you know in doe in dot language you would say Option one is a slam dunk. So we're gonna say proceed. We're gonna also tell the school to apply for open streets. And if it gets back in time, we can go with that option because it'll give them more control. I mean, that's certainly a possibility and I can't see why they would not agree to it. Because there isn't a lot, as you can see, the setup with option one is not, not expensive. And do those 
you're talking about they, they stay there all day long and all night or do they come in and out well, that that's gonna probably open um you know it's at nighttime and on weekends that'll, so that'll those little open. things just pick up and you can move them is that the idea so, yeah okay i guess you just someone's gonna have to man it that's the other thing that's going to be described or talked about at this meeting is you have to talk about labor when you talk about um, barriers. You can ask the people at Peck Slip about that one. So we really do have to talk because one of them is NYPD and one of them is a school. So we have to have that vibrant discussion at this meeting. Um, I'm not. Yeah, this is Rosa. Hi. Hi. Um, so I'm at 150, obviously, as you guys all know, um, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm on the SLT there and um, I would um, request that our new principal, Nico Victorino, be invited to participate in these meetings with the DOT since um, he probably has some opinion on them. He was there. Um, he was there oh, he was? and he is invited. Oh, okay. Yes, okay. absolutely. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and I. I mean, I'm looking at these pictures and those barriers look incredibly flimsy and not in any way a, a barrier, like in the, in a safety sense, um, more just like a visual guide, like the same kinds that I see sort of um, trying to separate bicycle lanes every once in a while that the delivery guys literally drive on top of and park on top of so that they can, you know, unload um, their stuff. So to, to me, that doesn't look particularly safe, which is a little concerning. Um, but I agree with you um, both that we should do both options. Well, they both certainly options. can make them more vibrant than that. And seeing that this is children and not just a restaurant, it will definitely be. I think their point was in showing us these that they really are something you can easily put down and pick up. Um, we were worried at Peck Slip with with some crazy person driving through them. Um, and when it comes to children, you know, you would want to make sure that we've already had those discussions with them. So that safety concern of someone going rogue or losing control of their car is definitely going to be a very big part of this discussion. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else have any thoughts? No. All right, great. And if something does come up, it's not going to be for the next week or so. So feel free to shoot me an email. Um, I'll be gathering ideas for this on my own between now and then and taking the consult of people who have done this before um, so that we make sure and consider all points of view as we go to, you know, secure this space for the school. And that is everything. So if there are no, no new business, nobody has anything different to say, um, we can adjourn. All right. Bye everybody. Thanks, Tricia. Bye everybody. Bye, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Good night. Good night, Good night everybody. Good night everyone. I'll stop the recording, Tricia.